update on a research and extension and education integrated grant that has multiple investigators. Pablo's a lead investigator, as is Jose Santos from the University of Florida. Essentially, USDA has funneled a lot of money towards genomics in livestock, not only in dairy, but also in beef. And not only in the standpoint of research, extension, and education, but there has been, shall we say, direction given to those that received the grant that you need to work together, and this needs to be collaborative. So we have given presentations simultaneously at Dairy Cattle Reproduction Council. We're working to lead our workshops together at the two grant groups, and we will also, in the future, be looking at each other's data sets to see what we can glean make that information more powerful to the end user. We'll turn it over to Pablo, who is a professor at Texas University. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Special thanks to Dr. Spencer's group for this opportunity to share our project with you this morning. And as you can see here, I'm representing a, a large group of researchers that are working all together in this study. So I guess a, a good starting point is to state that limited fertility, understood as a failure to achieve and maintain pregnancy, is a significant problem today for the dairy industry. And this relates to higher insemination costs, to a lower milk production, a delay in genetic progress, but also a higher risk for cooling. And we have seen historical trend to decline in fertility in dairy cattle, in the last 50 years, maybe more, I think that some contributing factors to this problem may relate to a different physiology of this cow, this high-producing cow, working different to the cow in the past. Also, this is making more difficult to reach a nutritional balance all the way in the lactation. We also have some changes in the hair size, also in facilities. And finally, more uh, related to this study, the genetic makeup of these cows is probably way different to the cow in the past. And this is what we have seen in the last 100 years, a big change in the cows, you can see here about Holstein cow, and the final result is a very high milk production, still with a pretty decent fat and protein production. Now, more important, uh, this is the trend of the change in milk that we have seen in the last 80 years. And you can see there, this is time, this is milk production. And I guess after you see this nice trend for so many years, it's difficult to think that this will continue for a long time, right? Now, if we zoom in and we go to the most recent 10 years, and we are talking here from 2002, 2011, still we see that this trend is going high. And now even the rate is greater than before. So you can see there, every year we have an increase of 280 pounds per lactation. The point what I, I want to make here is that I think we have still a good amount of variability in this population of cows that will allow to continue this selection process. For the cow. Now, as you know, this, this process of selection has been uh, more intense in the sire side. And I guess across the time, the big question has been, who are these superior males that we want to choose and that we want to use for the next generation, right? In other words, what is the true genetic merit of these sires that we want to pick and put in the AI system? Now, to answer this question, we have some, some elements. We have pedigree, so we can choose the top sire, a good dam, maybe. What we expect is a good combination to get a new sire. We have also performance in the female side, and all together is combined in a progeny test. Now, today we have a new player here, which is genome. And I think that this uh, new player is, is changing the process and it's going to keep making important changes. So, what is, what is the material for this genomic selection? And uh, Dr. Hansen showed it before, but let's say this is a piece of DNA. 
and we have four sides here. This is the material we're looking for. So it's a small change in these SNPs that we would expect to be related to a phenotypic trait. Let's say we have a change in our DNA and somehow we find an association with phenotype, meaning milk production, fat production, other shape, leg conformation. So whatever is related to something that we can see and we can measure. And I said that genomic selections, uh, genomic evaluations are here to stay. They have been here for five years, and now you can see how this number of is going up very nicely for females and males. We can we all agree that this has been a very successful process, right? We have a very nice increase in milk production, but at some point I would say we may find we have some side effects. And what, what I mean is we have a, we have seen a decrease in survival of these cows. Probably some health traits have been affected and fertility our case also has been going down. So, as you saw this before, we have seen this association. I'm not saying this is a cause effect, it's just an association, but we have seen that at the same time when milk production is going up, fertility is going down. This is not the pregnancy rate, we saw this before. So, we could say there is an opposite direction in the two traits. So what may be the explanation? The explanation maybe is that we are having an effect related to genetics and negative correlations in the genes, as I can explain, in a way that if you select just for production, reproduction is going to go down. So if, if we know that genetics is related to fertility, we can ask, okay, can we do the same? Can we work the same way we work with production now with and I think before we answer that question, I think the, question, the answer is yes. We need to focus on a big problem. And the big, the big problem is that for fertility traits, environment is very important. And we have a low heritability. And when we compare with production traits, we have about 25% of variation related to genetics. We say we have one quarter of the cow that we can handle with genetics. Now, when we work with health, or with fertility, we only work, go with one trend. So, the amount of material we have to make changes for the next generation is a lot lower. Now, in spite of this uh, negative point, we have some good news, and that is that the evolution of some reproductive parameters in the recent years is improving, and this is an example we saw this is before. So this is EPR, and this is a change in the trend going down, now it's going up. And what is more important for this study is that this happened right after the trade EPR was included in the science book. That means if we select the EPR, we can make a change. Some other positive uh, events. Calvin interval is going down, conception rate now is steady. And also, as you saw before, even with this negative correlation between production and fertility, we will find some individuals that have both a good reproduction potential and a good productivity. And this is, this is a chart showing a good number of sires, AI sires, classified by ESPPA and also by DPR, as you will see, we have a good number of sites that are going to be high in DPR and are going to be high in this study. And this is the same when we go to Netmetic and DPR, still we could find this population of specific sites where you will combine good reproduction and good production. Having all this in mind, we decide to go with this study that is a study funded by NIFA. We are now in the second year, and what we are trying to do is to work with genomic selection to improve fertility, and we are emphasizing in cyclicity and pregnancy. So, this is our group. 
we are working with seven universities, 12 researchers, and we go all the way from expertise in reproduction, extension, bioinformatics, genomics, and economics. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice uh, combination of, of people working together. So our, our first objective is to use these new molecular technologies that are getting available and are getting in a lower cost to try to improve this fertility trait by genomic selection. So what, what are we doing? Which this is our first uh, specific objective. We are trying to build a fertility database combining genotypes, so in this side, with phenotypes that are going to be based in measures of fertility in hosting cows. So what's the idea? We're following a good number of cows, checking for all these phenotypes related to fertility, and then reading the genes in these cows to have the potential of what is making the group to decide to go with this trait? Well, the idea is to follow what we think is affecting fertility, and we know probably related to these four factors, delay return to estrocyclicity after calving, limited estrocyclicity, regular fertilization, and pregnancy loss. Now, when we have all these phenotypes and we read these cows, we are going to try to find these SNPs, so these points in the genome of these cows that may be related to fertility. And the final goal is to build a model where we can estimate breeding values. That means the same you get in the sire proof, a PTA value for fertility or for different traits related to reproduction. At the same time, we go with an extension and education component and the idea of provide what, what we find to the, the industry, but also trying to educate the students in animal health, reproduction, and genetics. This is our approach. We are following 12,000 cows in seven states, in a number of farms in each of these states, and also working in the cool and hot season. Now, this is already done. We have followed these 12,000 cows. And this is what we are measuring. So we are looking for uterine health, checking for metritis, endometritis. Then we are checking for resumption of ovulation after calving, some metabolic disease, subclinical ketosis, detection of estrus, body consumption score, lameness, so everything that may be affecting this fertility in this group of cows. Very important, we are looking for pregnancy at the first and second AI but also maintenance of pregnancy. So we check the cows early after breeding, and then we check again, so we know who is losing the embryo. Of course, together with all this, we have production data, health events, and more. This is a summary of what we have been doing, and we went from cows that were in roller calving, and we followed the cows all the way to pregnancy confirmed at 60 days. So you could, you could guess that the big challenge here is to do all this with group, with big group of cows, trying to find the same cow every time. So it's very challenging to get this cow enrolled and then check all the way through pregnancy, especially with big farms as we are doing in, in the panhandle here in Texas. I want to show you some of our results. Just to show you what is important here, this is metritis, this is every farm, this is summer, this winter. And what I think is, is the relevant point here is that we have been finding a good level of variation. You see we have uh, values from 7% to 47%. Now for clinical endometritis, all the way from 8 to 43%. What we want to do is to compare this cows within farm within No, we go and do it at 7 days for metritis, then we go at 28, 32 days for clinical endometritis. Cyclicity, again, we have some variation, but it's maybe close to 60, 65, 70%. Through clinical ketosis, a big change from 2 to 47%. The important one, pregnancy at first AI, probably close to 40%. Pregnancy loss, very variable, 2% to 80%. Now, when we have all these values, and we have them now, we want to rank our cows. So what, what's the idea? We want to have 
the top fertility cow and the low fertility cow. And how are we thinking we're going to do this? We're we going to build a reproductive index. This is our index, which is a predictive probability for the cow to get pregnant after two AI. So what, what is good about this? You will have one number for each cow. So it's very simple to rank cows from the bottom to the top. And we, we expect to have something like this. We have some values already with the index, and this is, the distribution is very nice. We have a normal distribution here. And what is more important, I think, and this is the reproductive index by, by quartiles, 25%, 50%, 75%, And this is the probability for the cow to get pregnant after two AI. But as you can see here, the highest the index, the highest the probability. So this is to be working fine. We will have these cows sorted, and then we want to decide to have the top and the bottom, and these cows are going to be submitted for genotype. Why? For two reasons. Because we have to have a clear differentiation between good and bad, but also because it's very expensive. So we cannot do the 12,000 cows, we can do just 2,200 cows. Again, top cows, bottom cows. This is what we're going to use. We're going to use the highest density platform, 700,000 points that we are going to be reading across these cows. Now, 700,000 is not a lot when you see the size of the genome, right? But we expect to find something there. After we have this data, we are going to pass this to the bioinformatics team, and what they are going to be doing is to put the association between the DNA, what is showing our DNA, and what is happening in the phenotype. They will make the connection, and as Dr. Hansen showed, <coughs> we expect to find some of these points in some of these chromosomes that may be related to our fertility. Now, to be safe, after we have this result, we are going to go back, we are going to get a new set of cows, 1,000 cows, and as they are doing, we are going to get a group of sires. Again, extreme sires for BPR, top ones, bottom ones, and we are going to run the same to see if we have the same mistake. After we have these values, our uh, intent is to go and find why these points are making a difference, and if we are lucky, we can situate them close to a gene, even inside a gene. Final goal will be to be able to estimate the screening values for our index, but also for each of our phenotypes that we estimate. So let's say we will be able to create PTAs for this fertility trait. This is, this is what we expect to do. It's a five-year project. We are right now here, finishing our second year. We have the phenotypes, we are deciding which are going to be our cows to be genotyped, and then the, the bioinformatics group is going to start working with the numbers to be able to buy uh, this uh, model. And of course, we are going all the way from education to education. And I think with that, I'd be glad to take any of uh, the questions.